Good morning. My mother loves to tell uh, this story about me because it's kind of a cute story. Uh, my, my, I'm the youngest of three, and my middle brother, Philip, uh, he really wanted to play catch. Uh, but both of my parents were working at the time, and uh, they, they were busy. So they, he said, uh, Mom, Dad, why don't you play catch with me? He said, No, we, we can't. We're busy. And he said, Well, what about your older brother, Robert? What about him? He said, Well, he doesn't want to. Well, what about Brian? And Philip scoffed. He said, He doesn't count. And I was in earshot, and it broke my heart. And I decided I wouldn't take this laying down. I, I stood up, puffed up my chest, and said, I do too. One, two, three, four. I couldn't have been more than two or three years old at the time. I was a kid. I didn't get it. This morning I want to unpack a really complicated idea that the disciples didn't really get. And I, I feel like on our own journey as we follow after Jesus' disciples, uh, we don't get it either. The, the, the text for us this morning is going to be Matthew chapter 17. Starting in verse 1, it says this. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with them. And Peter said to the Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And he was still speaking when a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise, have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, Then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? He answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. And then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. The disciples get this rare glimpse behind the curtain. Uh, there's this Greek word, apocalypse, which is where we get our, our, the name for our last book of our Bible, Revelation. And that word means literally a, a pulling back of the curtain to see what's really going on. It's kind of that Wizard of Oz moment. In Matthew chapter 17, they get this curtain pulled back. Jesus is veiled in human flesh. He is a man, just as they are. But he's also the very God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They have this moment where everything seems to make sense. Peter, his reaction is, it is good for us to be here. Here in front of him, is, is Moses, who embodies the law, who embodies the structure of society, who embodies their past. You also have Elijah, the prophet, the most famous of all the prophets. And the prophets express the will of God for the people, the will for their future. And, and so, for Peter, he sees the people's past, the people's future, and he sees Jesus in the middle, glorious above all of it. And he knows this is the kind of place that he wants to be. So much so that he begins to erect kind of monuments to the occasion. Now I think we have moments like this. They're kind of few and far between, but you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Where we have this acute sense that the way that our life is going is, is where we want to be. Sometimes, uh, at least for me, a lot of times it happens around the holidays when, when my family is all together, 
when I've worked hard, so I've been able to take time off, and my family's together, and when we talk about our plans, we talk about the, the things that we want to do, we sing together. I mean, those moments are precious. And I think, yes, this is what it's supposed to be like. Another time that that happens for me is uh, church camp. Uh, when I was growing up, I used to have, be surrounded with people who were committed to God, who were committed to the, the things that they should be, and I, I look around and said, man, this is, this is what it's about. We have these moments where we, we understand that our, our lives are in line, that we're not acting just for our good today, but we're acting for our good tomorrow, next week, next month. And we're not just, in, just acting in a way that's good for us, but in a way that's good for our family, for our spouses, for our community. Today, tomorrow, next year, that we align our behavior in a way that's proper across all these different areas. And Elijah and Moses and Jesus are all there, and then he has this, the, 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 the past and the present and the future are all there lined out in front of him. And he says, this is what it's about. And Jesus, in all of that, he, the others disappear. In all of this, the past, the present, and the future, Jesus is glorified above all of it. And Peter begins to understand that this moment is a transcendent moment. This is the way that things really are. And you would think that the story would continue with them acting in faith. They say, I've got a glimpse of what's important. I've got a glimpse of what life is supposed to be like, and I'm going to follow it. But that's not how the story goes. Verse 14 says, And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him, and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic, and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And the boy was healed instantly. When the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? He said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have the grain, a faith like the grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. You see, Jesus comes down from the mountain with these disciples, and they, they can't quite get it. They have a taste of what it is to live a transcendent life, to live a, a genuine life, to live a life where the curtain is pulled back, and you're living in harmony with, with yourself, with those around you, and with God. And they get back down, and they still don't get it. He says, you can't cast it out because you don't have the faith. He says, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. I love that metaphor. Because for Jesus, faith is not just simply believing a thing. For Jesus, faith is embodied. Faith is always embodied. It can't just be in your head. And so if you're going to have faith, that means you're going to have faith in the gospel, the good news that leads to that kind of transcendent life. And you're going to live like the gospel is true. And if you're living like the gospel is true, then what Jesus says is a mountain can't stop you. There is nothing that will stop you from, from living that kind of life that is uh, in contact with the transcendent, with, with, with these moments of clarity, a genuine life. But what is this gospel that he's calling the people to have faith in? He calls attention to it in verse 22. As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And the disciples were greatly distressed. You see, they still hadn't gotten it. They had seen a taste of the glory of God. 
It's a taste of what a, a, a life that li is lived in submission to the Father could look like. A, a powerful vision of Jesus glorified. And yet, the gospel that makes that all possible is a gospel that is rooted in death and then resurrection. They didn't want to suffer. They didn't expect the Messiah to die, and yet Jesus says, this is, this is what's coming. This is the gospel. My, my gospel is about dying, denying yourself. My gospel is about the cross. We embody that ourselves. One of the most powerful ways that we embody that is through baptism, where we die to our sins, are raised to newness of life. It's a commitment. We're also supposed to embody that in our daily lives, though. The way that this works is maybe there are things about you that need to die. For you to live a transcendent life. Maybe the way that you treat your spouse when you're angry needs to die. Maybe some of the habits that you've developed need to die. Some of your time spending habits, they need to die. Maybe some of your dreams need to die. Maybe some of the things that you've been holding on to that, that, give, that you think give you meaning need to die so that you can embrace the things that truly give you meaning. Maybe our egos need to die. There's so many things that are on us that we just need to let go so that we can access this transcendent way of being that Jesus models for us, that we see modeled for us in this vision. There are a variety of things that we might need to get rid of so that we can align our lives properly. Not just with ourselves, but with the people around us, with our families, with our communities. And not just now, but, but tomorrow and forever. To live a genuine life rooted in the gospel. But what's great about that is the death that you have, the, the putting those things off, letting those go, does not end there. It also has rebirth. That if you let the way that you treat your spouse when you're angry die and, and let God bring something else out of that, it's going to be better. It's going to be glorious. And you're going to have yourself one step closer to that transcendent reality. The way that Paul talks about it in Romans is that every day we... Uh, that, that, that every, everything that God is doing works together to form us into the image of His Son. We are to embody the gospel of Jesus, death and rebirth, as we put away the things that hold us back and embrace the things that should bring us forward. And so the question is this morning, are we going to align our lives properly? No, we can't always have that mountaintop experience where the stars align and we have that glimpse. But what we can do is we can pursue that every single day. And I can tell you, if you do, there's going to be death and rebirth in your life. Things are going to get messy and God's going to have to work on you and it's going to be painful but it's worth it. Because it's that kind of life that pulls back the curtain. It's that kind of life that is true. That life centered around the gospel. And so this morning, maybe you need to die and be reborn. Maybe you need to commit to follow that gospel for the very first time this morning. If that's something you need to do, the water is ready. Maybe you did that a long time ago, but you've embraced a lie. You've rejected a life that is bigger than what we know and settled for what the world has given you. If you need to put Christ on, 
and, and repent this morning. This is, this is a time for that as well. If you have any need, would you come as we stand and as we sing?